So what that leads us to is a situation where you could um, be quarantined, forcibly quarantined, because a state official claims that they felt that you had, may have had COVID-19. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, in a conversation that is being recorded on the 4th of May, 2020. And I am getting an influx of visitors from my ancestral homeland of England recently, asking for more sources of alternative information from the British Isles. And you will note that I, of course, recently talked to um, Kit Knightley of Off-Guardian.org, providing alternative news and information about the COVID-generated crisis uh, on a daily basis over there at off-guardian.org. And one of the sources that they are publishing on a regular basis is today's guest, who I hope you are familiar with, but if not, this is a good time to acquaint yourself with his material. It is Ian Davis of in-this-together.com. And if that's too much to type out, don't worry. The link will be in the show notes, as always. I hope you will check out the work that he's doing. He's had some very insightful and interesting articles on this crisis, uh, starting most recently. uh, COVID-19 is a statistical nonsense and he also wrote on Lock-In 20, The Lockdown Regime Causes Increasing Health Concerns. And he's also written a series, Coronavirus Lockdown and What You're Not Being Told, Parts 1 and Part 2. So we're going to be delving into that material today. As always, again, those will be linked up in the show notes if you are curious to get the links directly. But let's bring him on board. Ian Davis, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, James. It's a pleasure. All right, let's start uh, with just some introduction about yourself, how you came to start In This Together, and why In This Together? Well, um, I'm, I've, my, my background is in health and social care. I've worked in that for the uh, best part of 30 years. Um, and then, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, I was made redundant due to austerity cuts. Um, and uh, at that time, I'd already uh, been interested in in this kind of information for quite a while. And I was, think I started the blog um, maybe four or five years ago, but I hadn't really put a lot of attention into it. But when I was made redundant, I thought this was an opportunity to do that. So um, I've been putting a lot more time into it since then. Um, and I think in this together came about because at the time it was uh, being bandied about by the then Conservative government. Um, Certainly uh, uh, David Cameron was using the phrase quite often. Um, And the the thing that we I noted about the the use of that phrase, as you often talk about, about how the way words are spun, as we are seeing now with the new normal, um, is that um, it was the opposite of us being in this together we were in fact being divided um and 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 really you know we are we are in this together as in the as in the population but but whether that extends to the people that are making the decisions is a is a different matter i think i think so too and that is one of the phrases that is being bandied around in, around in this crisis along with stay home it's we're all in this together as madonna says in her bathtub surrounded by her rose petals as she gets her servants to go out and fetch her things i'm sure you know with surrounded in her million dollar mansion yeah we're all in this together right yeah. madonna yeah exactly so i i think it is apt we are in this together and uh, certainly there yeah. is a distinction between the people who seek to rule over us so let's set the table for the conversation and uh, just get a sense of reality on the ground uh, in the UK at this point. Um, tell us a little bit about the legislation that's been passed, some of the latest developments. What's going on in the UK today? Well, things are moving incredibly quickly. Um, we've just recently today, there's some statutory uh, legislation going through, uh, secondary legislation uh, called statutory instruments, which are going through, which are further um, adding to Uh, the Coronavirus Act, which came out, um, I think, at the end of March, um, which basically means that um, if you are, if, if, if an official of the state considers that you may potentially be infected, then it adds to existing legislation um, as a 1984 act. It, it adds it adds to considerable powers they've got under that to detain people um, and forcibly quarantine them if necessary. Um, 
but the but the but also the impact of the coronavirus legislation on the 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 validity of the statistics that we are getting about the coronavirus um, and and the impact of COVID nineteen on health um, is quite significant um, because what it's basically led to is a situation where all the normal safeguards that are in place to stop not not necessarily well they, the safeguards were put in place to stop abuse of the system but also those safeguards are checks and balances that enable the people who collect the statistics such as the office of national statistics to be able to rely upon those those figures what the coronavirus act has effectively done is remove those checks and balances and then when we look at also the way that the um that COVID-19 is both tested for and the fact that, you know, research has shown that up to 80% of the people that are tested positive for coronavirus, uh, for sorry, for the underlying virus, SARS-CoV-2, don't necessarily go on to develop COVID-19, which is the syndrome that comes from it, then even, even the people that we do know have tested positive for um, SARS-CoV-2, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they've got COVID-19 and that has impacted their health. Unfortunately, what the, what the statistics are showing that is that anybody who has even got a mention of COVID-19 on the, um, the death certificate, it is therefore deemed that they died in, from a statistical sp- perspective of COVID-19. And that and that that relationship is far from clear. It, it's not it's not evident from those figures that that is the case. Before we start delving into those statistical details, let's just let's just clarify with the Coronavirus Act and the various other statutory um, provisions that are being put rammed through at this point. Uh, short of some some summary execution for the uh, crime of being suspected asymptomatic carrier of this virus. Uh, it, really, what are the limits on what the government can do? I mean, they can quarantine you. They can forcibly inject you. What? Where? Where is that line? At least theoretically, legally, at this point. Well, theoretically, legally, at this point, they can. The, the law states, I, 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 we did speak about the Act earlier, I, forget, I forget the precise name of the Act, but there's a, 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 the uh, Prevention of uh, 1984 Act. Uh, where basically, it enables you to be forced into treatment if you have got a communicable disease which um, you know, presents a risk to public health. But that treatment doesn't necessarily extend to anything like vaccination or anything like that. It just means treatment to to make you well, um, and but not necess- and to and to quarantine you. And just for what the record, we're seeing. Sorry, just for the record, that is the Public Health Control of Disease Act, nineteen eighty four. I will put the link in the show notes for people who are interested. Yeah. So, but what the Coronavirus Act does is reduce the burden of medical proof in order to start using that act um, to force you into treatment and or quarantine. So, rather than the the act was intended that that that, that medical burden of proof would be quite strong, that, you know, that there would be a, a confirmed a, a case and that that would usually come from t- at least two corroborating medical opinions but the coronavirus act removes that in fact it removes the need for a corroborating medical opinion entirely what it does is it puts that decision making into the hands of state officials so that could be uh, you know someone from the local authority a health inspector or so forth or a police officer anyone who suspects that you may have coronavirus or may have COVID-19, all those powers under that act are then applicable under the, because effectively they've been amended by the coronavirus act. So what that leads us to is a situation where you could um, be quarantined 
forcibly quarantined because a state official claims that they felt that you had may have had COVID-19. And what kind of testing are they doing at this point to even theoretically confirm this? Well, the, I think that the te- there are there are two tests. There is there is batch testing called C. There's there's RT PCR, uh, which which the 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 guy that invented it, uh, Carrie Mullis, said that um, that it is not it cannot identify a virus. Uh, it's not intended to identify a virus. All it's intended to is intended to do is isolate RNA RNA sequences. Um, and then be amplified through PCR to possibly see if those RNA sequences can be matched to a known virus. But obviously the virus needs to be isolated first in order to make that match. And there's considerable doubt about whether that has actually been done. So it's difficult to know how you could say from that that the RT-PCR test identifies a virus. However, I'm not medically qualified and, you know, better medical minds than mine have, have agreed that is the case. But the problem with that as well is that they're using that test to say, as I mentioned earlier, that somebody has got COVID-19. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Most people, and, there, and there's plenty of studies, I think uh, Oxford, um, Oxford University have recently put a study out where they estimate that between 5% to 80% of people who test positive for SARS-CoV-2 don't have COVID-19. So they don't they don't have the symptoms of COVID-19. And obviously the, the, the COVID-19 symptoms are the coughing and the high temperature and the and so forth. But without those symptoms, you don't actually have a disease. You have a virus. Well, we've all got viruses. We've got viruses inside. We live with it, live with viruses all our lives. In fact, you know, we, we evolved in concert with viruses. That's part of us, our microbiome and so forth. So to say that the presence of the virus therefore means that you have this disease, A, if you've got no symptoms, you're unlikely to be spreading it because you're not coughing and you're not you're not perspiring over over things and you're not you're not shedding the virus in that way um and obviously what that means is from a from a, a gathering sort of meaningful statistics about what is actually happening it's very difficult to say that that people who are being declared as having coronavirus or covid-19 do actually have that do actually have covid-19 And now on top of that, even that form of testing isn't necessary to declare someone suspected of having it as essentially being treated as if they have it, as you said. So uh, it's layer upon layer of nonsense that's piling up here. And you did mention uh, specifically the Office of National Statistics and and their role in this. Another entity that you, you write about that I don't know a great deal about in my Canadian ignorance is the CQC, the Care Quality Commission. Can you speak a bit about what that is and their role in this? Yeah, the Care Quality Commission have oversight of all social care um, in England and Wales. So they are the commission who set the standards for and inspect those that those standards are being applied in care settings in England and Wales. So that includes um, care homes, residential care homes uh, and uh, people that are being delivered social care in the community. It doesn't include nursing homes. Well, it, it does include nursing homes to a certain extent, but but nursing homes also come under obviously the provision of the National Health Service. So the the Care Quality Commission are more about um, oversight of social care. But in the case of the current situation, um, what we've got at the moment is the Care Quality Commission have been given an additional responsibility to report on suspected COVID-19 deaths from care homes, which is which is increasing the, the, the numbers of deaths significantly 
but that too, I mean, obviously nobody wants to see anybody die. I mean, it's, you know, it's awful when someone dies, but people, people obviously do die, especially older people who live in care homes. And if you look at the demographic pattern of COVID-19, it is indistinguishable from quite normal mortality in terms of its age distribution. So, you know, we, we you you do the in in reality expect people to die in care homes. That happens. I mean, certainly you're going to have a higher proportion of people dying in care homes than any other single setting. So, you know, that's that's the situation we've got at the moment. And as I say, you do go through this in a great degree of detail in COVID-19 is a statistical nonsense. Um, But let's talk about the way that you framed this in your previous article, because I like this framing of it. Lock in 20, the lockdown regime causes increasing health health concerns, where you talk about a a recently identified public health crisis, lock in 20, and how that's contributing to uh, some of the health concerns that we're seeing right now. Can you elaborate on that for the listeners? Yeah, I mean, certainly if um, you even if you look at it from even if you accept that everybody who is said to have died from COVID-19 did die from COVID-19, those numbers are less than currently. If you look over the last three periods reported by the Office of National Statistics, they still only represent less than 45 percent of the total numbers of people that are dying over and above the the average excess mortality. So excess mortality is is different from all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality is the mortality of everybody in a given, given period. Excess mortality is the mortality that you might expect from seasonal variations or um, particularly we normally talk about winter excess mortality because that's the, the mortality of people dying from the from colds and flu and so forth and pneumonia, the normal things. Right. And it's obviously compared to some sort of baseline average. This is the baseline average yeah. for this year or this season or whatever we're comparing it to. And this is in excess of that. Yeah. So you might call what we're seeing at the moment additional excess mortality. So the the, the, the Office of National Statistics take a five-year average for what they would normally expect to be quote unquote excess mortality and what we're seeing at the moment in the UK well in in England and Wales is an additional amount of mortality above that now the media are reporting that as if that is pretty much due to COVID-19 but when you look at the statistics less than half of that is due to COVID-19 now we've currently got the 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 um uh, the health, the chief chief uh, medical officer of the UK, um, Chris Whitty, said on the thirtieth that we have to understand that there's a there's a difference in the mortality. There's the mortality that we see from COVID nineteen, which is is itself highly questionable, and then there's the mortality that we are seeing as a result of the NHS effectively not treating normal the the things that it normally does which includes cancer care cancer screening we there's 170,000 people a year die every year in the UK from from coronary heart disease they're not being treated or screened at the moment so the, there was an estimate i think it came from i can't, i think it came from the health service journal which is like um uh, the trade journal for the NHS, who estimated that currently those presentations for for heart screening and for coronary heart disease screening are down by 40%. Well, 40% of 170,000 people is a lot more than the numbers of people that we're necessarily seeing dying from COVID-19. So, and, 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 there are there are many health professionals in the UK that are starting to speak out about this. Uh, the Royal College of Pathology have raised significant concerns about the 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 vague the vague statistics that we are getting, the unknown causes of death within those statistics, 
and the fact that we are seeing a very large spike in mortality, which cannot be attributable to COVID-19, even if you maximise the statistics of COVID-19, that's still less than 45% of this additional excess mortality that we're seeing above the statistical norm. So none of this, I think, will be particularly surprising to any of my audience, whether in England or internationally, because this is happening internationally at this point, this type of statistical chicanery. But as I've pointed out before, um, this is not really, the I think, the, the fundamental point of all of this. This is just the statistical nonsense that they are using to pull the wool over the public's eyes while all sorts of things are happening on a much greater scale. And... Uh, I don't know what the exactly the right analogy is to use, but something like uh, people are doing some sort of, you know, white glove test for dust in the house. Meanwhile, right next door, a, a gigantic volcano is erupting and spewing magma all over the place and we're all going to die. But uh, people are worried. Oh, I don't know how much dust there is on this shelf. I don't know if that's the right analogy, but something like that. Uh, arguing about the statistical nonsense that they're putting in front of us seems to be almost missing the point um, because there is so much more going on. And even just looking at that idea of excess mortality, well, how about the excess mortality we are going to see from the widespread poverty that is going to be caused by millions upon millions of people internationally suddenly finding themselves unemployed and unable to put food on their table? That is coming. It is happening right now. And uh, that is one of the effects of lock-in 20 that we still haven't even really begun to feel the worst effects of yet. Um, so there's a lot more to this. And I want to get your sense, what's your reading on the ground in, in England right now? How many people are swallowing this? How much pushback is there against the statistical nonsense? How much do people seem to be uh, under the spell of the MSM on this? I mean, I, I get a sense, I mean, pure, I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? We're, I mean, one of the interesting things is that the, the government have already said one of the last places that they're going to consider reopening are pubs, clubs, restaurants. So the places where people physically go to meet and to discuss ideas and sh and talk are going to be the last places they're opening. When, when, when the, the ridiculous thing about that is they are, I don't know how, quite how this works, but they're obviously suggesting that workplaces and shops where people mingle, it's, it's fine to go to, to your local supermarket to go and do shopping, but it isn't fine to go to you know, uh, uh, another social place and to, to, to talk openly with, with people there. So that's, I, I don't know quite how the virus knows the difference, but apparently it does. Um, and we, so the, the sense I get if you look at, so this is a terrible metric by which to go by, but it's pretty much all we've got at the moment, social media um, is that you know there is there is there seems to be a lot more people that are openly questioning it on and some prominent journalists as well which is which is good news um, certainly um, you know Peter Hitchens in in the UK um, John Pilger people like that are are questioning it which is good and in fact there was a, a very good report the other day in the Mail which I will I'll, I'll send to you. Um, which was by, now I can't remember the, the Lord, but I think he's former law Lord that was basically saying that, that, you know, what we're giving away, we're giving up living in, or, in order to save, potentially save an unknown number of, of lives. So we're, we're giving up life <laughs> uh, in order to, in order to, in order to, you know, save a, an unknown number of people. And, and people who are, likely they're in that demographic where mortality is high anyway now that doesn't mean you know I'm, I'm not suggesting that oh well that's okay then i'm just pointing out that that is the reality of the situation these people are in that demographic and it, you, that that's the truth and i want people to cogitate on an exceptionally interesting point that you just raised there to think about we have peter hitchens and john pilger on the same side of this issue 
that should tell you, once again, as I pointed out in my conversation with Kit Knightley, this is not about left and right politics as we've known it. This is about something different. It's about authoritarianism versus its opposite. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of authoritarians on the left and the right who are in support of what's going on right now. And it's interesting to see that distinction being made. And suddenly you have Peter Hitchens and John Pilger arguing on the same side of an issue. Again, I think this shows there, there's something very different going on right now. And uh, I, I want people to, to bring that to the forefront of their consciousness and make note of who is in favor of the stripping of your most fundamental rights, the rights that have been uh, shored up after centuries of essentially warfare but between the people and their would-be rulers. Um, and lots of blood has been spilt over the centuries uh, trying to win these rights uh, in, in the favor of the average person. We are in this together, not with them. That is the point of this. And yeah. I think that's, that's where we have to come yeah. back to find that bedrock truth. I think something else as well that it's revealed, it's also revealed some divisions within what we might call the alternative media as well. And I think Kit, Kit Knightley referred to this the other day when he was talking to you. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it just seems that some of the people that we have relied on perhaps a little bit too much thinking about in, in the past for information um, are equally happy to see that um draconian state uh, which is quite well just surprising from some of the people that that's come from it's been very surprising so it does make you it does make you wonder you know what where where people are with this uh, and going back to your question that you were saying about what's my sense of how people are responding to this the, the only way I, you can know it, I think it's this is probably more reliable than talking to people on social media, which is a bubble anyway. You're only talking to the people that you talk to. If I if I think about my local community, yeah, I get the sense talking to people that the uh, people are are sceptical. They are starting not to buy it. Now we've had this thing, and I'm, this is a again. I mean, this is a global thing of people clapping. On, on Thursday nights in, in the UK, they all get out and they started clapping. Now, initially, that clapping was non-existent where I live. <laughs> no, nobody was clapping in the first week or so. Then people started to clap a bit more. And I noticed it peaked about a couple of weeks ago where there were lots of people clapping. But since then, it's definitely died down. So... So, yeah, I think I think people are getting wary and weary of it as well. You know, that is interesting because that probably is in some way a more accurate metric than we'll ever be able to get from these online conversations that we know bots of various sorts exist and uh, the conversations can be manipulated online and who knows who you're really talking to and all of that. And as voices continue to get censored off of the net for going against you, you contradicted WHO and NHS guidelines on this. Therefore, you must be silenced from the internet. It will become less and less accurate a metric um, the, by, you know, to gauge public opinion, social media and all of that. But clapping, I mean, that's something that you uh, physically experience and hear and can sense on, on in and of itself. And as you say, it peaked a couple weeks ago. Perhaps support for this widespread lockdown is uh, decreasing. And not to, not to brag, but I must say I haven't been surprised yet by any of the alt alternative sources that are 100% in favor of draconian lockdown. I I have long understood that there are authoritarians in our midst, and it's it's easy to see once you start to 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 see it in those terms. And one sense, one one of the issues that I think is a good one for for finding that out is uh, whether people are completely on board with the the green agenda, UN you know agenda twenty thirty, and all of that stuff. And uh, you, you cannot question climate change science and all of that. You, you see, a lot of those people are on board with this quarantine lockdown. I know you've done some great work on Greta and who's really behind that and yeah. some of the connections there. I will direct people in that uh, in that direction and in this together in your archives. Because uh, again, I think obviously these agendas are starting to come together and merging into, as I say, something much bigger than anything about this particular virus or these statistical uh, chicanery that's going on. Um, anything else that you'd like to say about the agenda, how it's unfolding, what's happening in England before we wrap things up? Yeah, I think it's just the, the speed 
the the pace of the of the changes that are coming. I mean, everything is coming on the back of this on the back of this panic. Um, I mean, and we we've talk, talked about you know the possibility of people being removed from their homes, of people being forcibly quarantined. But there's also uh, today that the that just recently and that we're now talking very openly about biometric IDs, the so-called immunity passport um, that that is that is coming very quickly in the UK. I mean, all the indications are that it that it is coming in the UK. Um, and you know, there's there's also the the fact that the legislation has changed to the point now where these statutory instruments are going through today. Um, which add further powers to um, detain people under protecting public health. Um, so it's it's really the pace of things and the fact that so many things are delivered. And and one thing that was that was very interesting today, uh, it came out yesterday, was the European Union. Um, they published a document called. Um, let me just have a quick look the global response working together to help the world get better. Uh, and in that, um, they have effectively said, um, there is an unprecedented, they, they, they've openly stated this. They go, this is the world against COVID-19. Um, and they've said, uh, paraphrasing here, but you can read the document, an unprecedented global cooperation between scientists and regulators, industry and governments, the World Health Organization, to join forces with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, which is the Wellcome Trust of basically GlaxoSmithKline. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Bill and Melinda so, Gates and, and uh, the Wellcome Trust were the two foundation partners of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic yes, Preparedness yes. and Innovation, which is uh, their tagline, of course, new vaccines for a safer world. Do you think there's any business interest behind this, let alone the other interests? I mean, it's just so in your face. And that's kind of the interesting part about it. And on that issue of the immunity passports, I will throw in the latest from our friends at The Guardian. Coronavirus UK, health passports possible in months, referring, referring to tech firm on Fido which is in talks with government about system to help Britons return to work. And I will uh, just direct people to the creepy infographic about how the health passports work of showing you how to, how to scan your face and get your antigen uh, antibody test and then scan your face at work and then it'll tell you whether or not you're okay to enter. This is the world we're heading into and anyone who looks at that and goes, oh, okay, well, I guess this is the new normal. Okay, oh, wh whatever. I, ca I cannot understand the mindset of people who are just going to roll over and take this. But I guess we're going to see from here. <laughs> and uh, it'll be yeah. interesting to see the, uh, the, the reaction to pe of people to this. And I hope people are not being sh too much shaped by what they are experiencing in social media or something like that. No, I hope people are grounded in a reality that isn't based on what's coming into them. Because uh, you're going to have to trust your instincts more so than ever before, I think. Now that you can't rely on the media and you can't necessarily rely on what you're hearing on social media and you can't talk to your friends in real life... So you're going to have to have a develop and sharpen your instincts on this, I think. Uh, on that note, it is important to find sources that are reporting on this in a truthful way. And so I will be directing people once again to in-this-together.com, where you've got some very detailed articles. And I think when people look through your articles, they will see the amount of links and research that you've put into them. Clearly some uh, well-researched articles. So I, my hat's off to you for that. Uh, Ian Davis, I think we're going to leave that there for today, but I hope we get to talk to you again in the future. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much, James. It's been a pleasure.